Very glad to be back here with you again at Holy Family. Happy New Year. The message of the readings this morning is that God's call to us is different and distinctive one from another. When I was 11 years old, I had to begin wearing glasses for reading and for distance. Turns out I was a bit nearsighted. I was always squinting at the giant screen in the movie theaters when I would go with my friends to see the movies. And in class, I was always squinting at the blackboard. I just did it out of habit, and of course, I was only 11 years old, and I wanted to hide that impairment from my parents. So I was very careful not to squint when my parents were around watching me because I didn't want to wear glasses. Because in my old neighborhood in Chicago, a kid with glasses was the instant subject of a lot of jokes. I went to Catholic school, and when I was 11, same year, the nun I had in class, she noted my squinting. And she didn't embarrass me in front of the whole class, but at recess, she pulled me aside and she asked me very quietly, she said, Stephen, nuns didn't use nicknames. Everybody calls me Steve, but nuns went, Stephen. She said, can you read the blackboard from where you're sitting? You're always squinting. And she said, I think you need to wear glasses and I have to discuss that with your mother. <laughs> Baboom. I ended up having to wear glasses only for reading and distance. Otherwise, when I was with my friends, I would quickly take them off and put them in my pocket. But when I did get them and I wore them for the first time, I was stunned because I could see everything much clearer and not in a fog. All of a sudden, I could see the leaves falling from the neighbor's tree across the street. I could now see the chalk marks on the blackboard. And I could recognize my friends halfway down the block. <laughs> it was only then, I think, that I realized in my own, you know, 11-year-old way that, hey, this is what other people see. And I had been missing that. Psalm 139, appointed for this Sunday, which we read, Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You press upon me behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. There's a theme that runs through the whole Bible, through the Old and New Testament, that God never gives up on us. God never gives up on us. And so we hear one of the oldest biblical stories this morning. God comes to a young boy, Samuel, and it's a voice at night in the dark. Only Samuel doesn't recognize the voice. He thinks it's the voice of the old priest, Eli, with whom he is living and he's apprenticing. Samuel, the voice says, Samuel gets up from his bed and he goes to the old priest who's sound asleep. Three times it happens, Samuel, the voice says this boy's name. And he goes to the old priest and he said, did you call me? And the old priest, I think, after a couple of times, he said, no, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. The third time this happens, old Eli suspects, well, maybe the voice may actually be God. So he tells Samuel, go and answer. Do you see, the point is, the initiative 
is all God's and God's persistence. It takes four tries to get Samuel's attention. And the sense of the story is that God will stay at it as long as it takes. Old Eli, the old priest role, interestingly, isn't to be the voice of God, but simply to suggest that Samuel might try listening to the voice calling his name. Now, we Episcopalians are not too comfortable at talking about our personal religious experiences. We don't do testimonies. We don't bear our souls in church in front of everybody. We're much better at discussing ideas about God and Jesus than describing the personal experiences of God. And the reason is that for many of us at least, we can't pinpoint a time or a date. There was no one moment, but rather a lifetime of moments and a long, slow process, both hot and cold, good times and bad, times maybe when you were bored with the Christian faith or at, with the church, or maybe you were angry at both God and the church. But Psalm 139 suggests that God has been pursuing us across the years. There's an acclaimed author by the name of Kathleen Norris, and she was raised in the Roman Catholic Church, and she left it of her own desire after years of seeking and searching and dabbling here and there, and finally she returned to her family's farm and she went to church in that little bitty town of Lemon, North Dakota. And she wrote in her book, Amazing Grace, I came to understand that God had not lost me, even if I seemed for years to have misplaced God. Her observation that God had not forgotten her, even though for years she seems to have been, she seems to have misplaced God, as she puts it, sounds very familiar. If, she wrote, you don't feel as close to God as you used to, who do you suppose moved? And the psalm continues, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence. You trace my journeys and all my resting places. You're acquainted with all my ways. God, you know everything about me. The rabbis in the synagogues have a humorous illustration that they teach to their students about Moses. And they'll say, you know, the burning bush, Moses went up on Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments. The rabbis say, the burning bush was not a miracle. It was a test. God wanted to find out whether or not Moses could pay attention to something for more than a few minutes instead of talking and whining all the time. And when Moses did stop talking and whining and complaining, God spoke. The trick is, to pay attention. There is another world right here within this one whenever we pay attention. If you feel that God is far away and not interested in what's happening, think again because God speaks your name and waits and waits as long as it takes. You see the same idea carried out in the gospel today about the man named Nathaniel who meets Jesus. It's a story in the same way, but of seeing something right in front of you and how difficult it really can be. Nathaniel's friend Philip tells him, Nathaniel, come and meet the one about whom Moses and the prophets wrote. It's Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Now, Nazareth is this little village. 
And Nathaniel thinks his friend is naive and too easily influenced. And I picture Nathaniel rolling his eyes. And so he says to Philip, Nazareth, Philip, are you kidding? That place, a Messiah? Nothing good can come out of that place. And I imagine Philip saying, okay, okay, fine, but would you just come with me? And so Nathaniel goes with him. And there follows this amazing encounter between the skeptical, all right, Nathaniel, and Jesus. Jesus acknowledges that Nathaniel is at least as honest as he's blunt. And Jesus says upon seeing Nathaniel coming toward him, he says, well now, here's an honest man. There's no deceit in him. He speaks his mind. And Nathaniel is taken by surprise and he says, uh, excuse me? How do you know me? And Jesus says, oh, I saw you back there lying under the fig tree before Philip called you. And boom, something happened to Nathaniel and he says, Rabbi, you are the son of God. Nathaniel begins to see things in a whole new way because of how Jesus sees him. And for Nathaniel, it's being seen by God that apparently makes the difference. And Jesus replies to him, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? Let me tell you, you're gonna see greater things than these. Seeing seems automatic if your eyes are wide open, but actually, isn't it true as we get older, we learn not to see. It can be difficult even when something is right in front of you, but sometimes we only see what we want to see. Nathaniel is changed by how Jesus sees him. Before Nathaniel had known Jesus, Jesus had seen and known him. I think that deep down inside we all long to be seen in this way, to be truly known by another and loved for who we are. Being seen like this changes Nathaniel and gives him new vision. Now he can see who's right in front of him. And Jesus promises that he's going to see more than that. Tomorrow we observe the federal holiday of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And himself, he was a man changed by how other people saw him and what they saw in him. He never wanted to be a prophet. He was a minister in a Baptist church like hundreds of other ministers in churches in Atlanta. But others saw something in him. So look through the gospel lens and recognize Christ in your neighbor, might be someone you don't apparently have a lot in common with, and I don't mean your literal neighbor maybe down the street necessarily, but maybe a co-worker, a relative, someone at church, someone maybe right in your own family. Come and see and get a glimpse of who God in Jesus Christ has made us to be. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.